Hi, my name is Ron Spencer, and I'm here with George Michael Bowen and uh, James Glass, and we are Let's Stick. Yay. Who are we missing here today? Oh, we're missing Julie McDermott. Last name, still McDermott? Yeah, close enough. Okay. And uh, a host of drummers, including the legendary Serge Ponce and uh, Rob Oswald. Okay. Also, Scott Hedrick, bass player, oh, for yeah. a couple of years. And Bill Alfin. Dollar Bill Alfin, wherever you are. And for a brief moment, Frank Howard. Yes. And that was very, very brief. I was, I was playing in a band called The Heretics uh, from Hampton, Virginia. And we played, I guess, at least one gig with Nocturnal Zoo. And so I saw Mike and Jim and uh, started hanging out with Mike a lot. And uh, it just I eventually left The Heretics and Mike eventually left Nocturnal Zoo. And, we started playing together, and then some point shortly after that, we got uh, Jim and Julie and uh, various drummers. But the idea was that we would present each show with some sort of opening uh, skit or segment that would uh, sort of draw the audience in. And most of the time, I think we did a pretty good job um, with not presenting something that was too obvious or or, or too... Um, Showy. Show. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like topical. It wasn't. It wasn't trying to be any, anything other than sort of bizarre and absurd. And um, a lot of times it worked pretty well. Okay. Yeah, I was not aware that Kim Valley had anything to do with the studio. And how he ended up there, I don't remember the the connection. I think he was thinking of buying it, or he had put money into the studio, or something. He was backing a producer by the name of Rick Mangini, who he claimed would be the next Rick Rubin. It's on the liner notes. Um, so when we got there, Rick Mangini mic'd us up. We started recording. Then this weird ass skeletal gray haired dude was sort of hanging around we're like who the fuck Kim is Fally. this? Yeah and uh, it turns out it's Kim Fally and none of us know who he is because well, maybe you did I don't know you had more. I knew the name but I, w I did not make the connection until after we had finished the studio. Yeah and he had done something with Sonic Youth sometime in the last few years prior to our single the re yeah. recording of Bubblegum. Yeah and they probably did it just to be connected to Kim Fally because they probably yeah. knew who he was. And, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, he was very generous. He enjoyed what we were doing musically. Uh, he actually sang on Puta, right? Yeah. He, he did a, sang like something a about zombie Vincent people. Price esque voiceover. Yeah. Uh, it's that you know, night, the zombie people come out. Yeah. yeah it was he was hilarious. Unusable. But he was really generous. Yeah. He wrote, I think, that was, which was a great document on the back of our first single. I thought that yeah. that was a really interesting, well written. Um, paragraph about the history of Norfolk as well. You know, it was part of Norfolk and part of what we were Which and he, what we. He did just on the spot. Yeah, well. that was amazing. Was that he wrote this basically his essay? I'm producing this band from Norfolk. But that was also his band. job too. For but he knew Norfolk. He knew Norfolk because yeah. of uh, yeah. Gene Vincent. And he literally with... wrote that out like as yeah. he was doing it. Very good at what he does. Um, when we put out our first single, the Trade Magazine Rock Pull wrote a review of the Kim Valley single, the Wild Groovy Cool and whatnot, and he really, really liked it. And uh, he sent us an invitation, or John Peel sent us the invitation on a postcard saying, if you ever get to London, we would love to have you. So the invitation was really um, for the group as it existed as Bud Steg then. We did not have the means or the time, and Ron had just left the band to get over there. So several years later, we finally got Merkin Records here in Baltimore to send us overseas, and we got to do a six on Peel session. So that was really, really a high point for the band as far as like, you know, A, we got to go overseas and play a couple of shows, um, Bristol and mm -hmm. London, I think. Um, and we got to spend two days recording, so that was nice. And that was, you know, yeah, an experience time. that you, I'll never forget anyways. Oh, yeah. I don't know, but I remember yes. you guys were working there. Well, then you need to, why don't you just go ahead and roll. You get the hell out of here! Um, Bamboo Hut was the single greatest it. job I've ever had in my entire yeah, life. definitely. You're Hands still wearing down. Colors, I see. Yes. Um, yeah, it was amazing. There was, what, like seven, eight, nine, I don't know how many people in bands. I think every, everybody was oh, in bands. Right. Tree Ford? Oh, yeah. Tree Ford. Brian Curry. Uh, Mike Cohn, Andy LaBarge, Chubb, Gary Zaroli, Vernon, myself, Jim. Was there anybody else? I don't know. Maybe some of the cooks were even in There's a lot of Asian people there. there. Yes. Yes. As you might imagine, uh, the Chinese food restaurant had 
Gray. Gray was a great, great person as well. Oh, all right. Gray, yeah. my, all right. My Gray. So, you, you know, you knew when you ordered Chinese food, you were getting a rock star to deliver. That was just a great job because there were a lot of people that you liked to hang out with working there. And we all had some sort of mutual respect for one another. And at various times, band members would go on tour, and everyone was happy to cover shifts. So you didn't lose your job. You were coming back to a job, and that was so important. You know, if you were going out for four or five weeks and coming back, knowing that that wouldn't be a problem for you. So there was a huge, you know, like, dependent network of people that uh, worked there, made good money, and for the most part, it was a relatively, you know, safe job. But I got robbed once at gunpoint. I don't know if you did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Great did as well. So there were some downsides, but ultimately the upsides were like, you know, pitching quarters with the cooks out back, like coming into work completely, well, for me anyways, drunk on box wine. Um, eating like pecan, like stealing pecan pies and Pepsis and trying to get my sugar level back up. Um, it was it was just a lot of fun. It was a very like wonderful atmosphere and place to be for like three years, I think. The first time I saw the Candy Snatchers, I believe was in Baltimore. Um, I had opened the auto bar on Davis Street in 2007. I didn't, I never saw them play in Norfolk. We were touring so much from 91 to 94 that we were out of town a lot, but I remember hearing these stories about them and how incredibly scary they were and they were catching each other on fire and victimized love them, so that meant that- What does that mean? That yeah. was important. <laughs> um, that we had basically, you know, we were no longer interesting and that they were the most amazing thing ever. Um, and that's probably why I never saw them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I just, I never, the opportunity never uh, came before we left. So. I did get to see them in 1997 or 98, somewhere around then, and I thought that they were one of the best live bands I'd ever seen. And they played several shows after that where they absolutely sucked horribly. They were drunk, they were sloppy, they were obnoxious, but the very first time they played the auto bar, and I don't know if they were just trying to show me what it was all about, but they did, and Larry was amazing. It was like watching like a punk rock James Brown, like he was all twisting around and looking really soulful and punk rockish and Matt had his foot on the monitor the entire set, he never slowed down for a second. It was incredibly tight and I remember just thinking that, you know, they were in fact everything that I thought they were going to be. And when they pulled away that night, or that next morning they were in this really horrible RV, the bumper was attached by an extension cord. It was like wrapped around and there was a shower curtain dragging <laughs> from behind the RV as they pulled away. And that was my memory of them, pretty much. My best memory. Uh, Worthless Disease. Uh, Laura, Lori, sorry. Lori and Kathy and Barb. And uh, they were, you know, good buddies uh, for a, a, a year or so. We would, I would hang out at their place. And they had this kind of mansion they lived in. I guess it was their folks place and they had this kind of little rock quadrant that they were able to just play and drink beer all the time and, and that was I really liked that band I mean I still would probably appreciate that music that kind of just you know jangly kind of pop you know I mean that speaks to me so that was you know good a good memory definitely but yeah myself and Brian Pafumi did a couple of events that went over moderately well they were awesome uh, and we did the thing called the Death of Vaudeville on the other side. That was another Leonard uh, uh, Clark, is yeah. that his name? Leonard Clark. Uh, the that was fun. Gary Zaroli sang Dream a Little Dream. No, he did not. He did not? He did not. Sorry, he did. You did? <laughs> I did. Oh, i Because he, uh, he... He practiced it then, We right? did. We rehearsed this bit, Gary and I, and I still kind of hate him for that. Um, he just... I guess they got a gig and uh, he canceled the night before the show. And we kind of worked this like organ and I guess in drag kind of German you know, whatever thing, and, he, and so I ended up having to do the bit, which, you know, I wasn't really equipped to do, and uh, yeah. it, I think it, it came off, though, but it was basically Dream of a Little Dream and kind of a fake German accent, and as a woman, uh, dressed as a very attractive woman, of course, and uh, I remember the mic cord was very short, so we had the guy with the snake holding it so I could get kind of into the stage a little bit. You remember that? It was like I couldn't get to the front of the stage, and so that was a good, that was a good one. I was a, um, a big fan of Frank Howard. I thought he was a really incredible, interesting guy. He was what you would imagine, like, you're weird. If your dad were like a punk rocker who was only like, how old was he? Like maybe 10 years older than us? I don't yeah, really probably. recall. But, he um, was 40, 41, maybe? 45, maybe? How old was he when he died? I don't know. We'd have to look it up on the website. Way to go, ladies. It's on the website. <laughs> 2000.
I think he was around 50 something. Yeah. I'm just going to yeah, assume yeah, someone yeah. in that neighborhood. But anyways, right. he was a really wonderful human being. And I know that he had stopped drinking, but in place of that, he smoked pot like every five minutes. Every so, five seconds. Every five seconds. He was either, he had a joint in his mouth or a cigarette in his mouth at all times. And he was incredibly knowledgeable about music. He drove this really weird, not weird, whatever, like a white cargo pickup yeah. thing. Because he had his own sound company. Yeah, he had his own sound it, yeah. company, and I would travel around with him setting up, uh, you know, speakers and, and helping him do all that stuff. That was like a part-time job that I had. So I got to know him really well. And he went on, I think, the first or second butt steak tour ever. He drove us, uh, what was it, Cleveland, oh, yeah. Kentucky, about that. somewhere else. But he was, you know, and he was our designated driver, which was awesome, too, because, you know, at least I was drinking a lot, and most of us drank quite a bit before shows to varying degrees. Um, so he was... Really, just a very generous, wonderful guy, and it's a shame that I was very surprised when Matthew died. I yeah. had not seen him in a long time, and uh, it definitely um, made me appreciate the fact that I'm alive because <laughs> I was like, There are so many circumstances I feel like that I could have met a similar fate, not for the same reasons he had, but just for being um, sick. But um, my favorite story about Matthew is that I think that. Uh, Somewhere right around the time we were getting ready to leave, we were going on tour, and Matthew and I had gone to Friar Tuck's, and they used to have this thing called the Dollar Drink Night, which was just an obscene playground <laughs> for an alcoholic like myself. Uh, and that's where I discovered rum and coke. I had never put those two together, but I found them there. And, um, church, right? Didn't we call it going to church? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we went to a Friar Tuck's Dollar Drink Night, which was every Sunday. We went back to where I was living at Mark Savisa's house. This guy Mark and Judy lived. And that morning, I made my mind up that I was going to the free clinic to find out what was on my penis. Um, because there was a bump there and I was all freaking out about it. It was just, you know, kind of mentally obsessing about this because who wouldn't? But anyways, I wake up, Matt's passed out on the couch and I'm getting ready to leave and he looks up and he's like, where are you going? And I'm like, I gotta go to the free clinic, there's something on my dick. Um, so he's like, can I go with you? And I'm like, sure. So Matt, can I, go, can I go with you? <laughs> so we go to the free clinic. We get to the free clinic at 9 a.m. like on a Monday morning, right near Norfolk General, and we're sitting there like really gross, still drunk, just like giggling and joking about everything. And he made the the visit, which was incredibly depressing. He made it really interesting and funny. And we uh, at one point we figured out that there was this one door when people were coming out of it. They'd clearly been told whether or not they had an issue. <laughs> So you know, people would be like walking out really happy or sad. Most of them were quite sad. You, know, you really don't end up at the free clinic unless there's something going on. Or you know someone. Who's <laughs> so that's hilarious. Yeah, he, just came he was sitting with me the whole time and he made me, you know, it, hel it helped a lot. And I had an ingrown hair on my dick. So it, there was no hair in it, but it was a white bump. So it was very terrifying. And I remember this big round portly black woman just laughing in my face. But... <sighs> It was one of the greatest moments of joy in my life. Like, you know, I don't celebrate much, but that is a feeling that I can recall to this day, thinking like, you know, thank God. My dick is good. Yeah, I mean, yes. it, was, it was part of being, you know, lecherous and drunk and stupid. So that just came with the territory. And I think Matthew understood that, you know, as well. So he, you know, he made that more interesting, I guess, less painful. A very sweet story. No, he was a wonderful guy. And I... I sincerely felt depressed about hearing him.